Anyway, so welcome, Dr. Drenz. Thank you again for coming. We're very, very happy to see you and to have you come back. And uh, I know that after last time, there were questions that had come through that people, you know, had more curiosity about dementia and, uh, uh, you know, more of the, uh, in terms of that condition for people. But, uh, and I've sent that to you and I'll, I'll let you deal with that uh, whenever you feel it's suitable during this time. But tonight's session, um, you're coming to talk to, talk to us about how to care for ourselves as caregivers of loved ones of dementia. So I'm, I'm pretty sure there's um, not one person on my screen that can't use a little bit more uh, help in that area. So I'm just gonna turn the time over to you. So thank okay. you for coming. Thanks, Shirley. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the, the two questions that, had, that Shirley had received were, um, how do you prevent dementia? How do you prevent, that was one, you know, how do you prevent dementia? Um, and I'll, I will uh, address that one first. And um, what we are learning about the things that we can do to prevent dementia, we obviously can't change our genetics, right? Because there is sometimes, there can be either a large genetic component to, to dementia illnesses, depending on the kind of dementia illnesses. You remember we talked about the fact that dementia is kind of an umbrella term under which all these different illnesses, you know, uh, fall. And some of them uh, happen to be more, uh, more common in families than others, but not so much Alzheimer's disease, unless it's early onset, sometimes that group uh, tends to be more run in families. And in that case, there's, there isn't a lot that we can actually do. Um, but in terms of the sort of the rest of us who have perhaps a, a more average risk for developing a dementia, the things that we can do that will help us, and they will help our hearts, but they'll also help our brains. So it's the same kind of, um, it's, it's interesting now that the, the practices that, you know, improve people's um, heart also now are understood to improve their brain function. So things that, you know, it's not a surprise, but things like physical exercise, and there we're talking uh, <clears throat> more around the actual aerobic type of exercise, not, you know, not, um, doesn't have to be high intensity, but it has it, ideally 20 minutes, four or five times a week, a, a brisk walk is, uh, is it actually has been shown to be very helpful. Um, stimulating your brain and continuing to learn. So it's kind of like what you're all doing here tonight, right? Is we, we need to keep bringing new information into our our brains so that um so that we're we're actually uh creating new nerve pathways in in our brains um keeping stress down as best we can is another very important aspect of um, preventing dementia and when we're that's the very reason I'm I'm here tonight to talk about self-care and looking after ourselves when we are caring for someone um, with a dementia or it caring for someone with any illness, really. Um, we really need to, to ex be open to recognize when stress is here and we need some strategies to reduce that stress when when we can, which is interesting because exercise is one of those big things that actually also helps us to reduce our stress. Good, hi Susan, hi, and sorry. hi Zori, um, and uh, the same as um, as actually stimulating our our brains with things that we enjoy. That's another really important way of reducing our stress. So that's why some of, some of the strategies we're going to talk about. There's some debate about whether diet actually influences our risk of dementia. And, um, you know, that depends on who you read when you read it um, as to what the actual uh, recommendations are. But there is... Um, 
the the Mediterranean diet um, and, a, and a specific diet called MIND, but I don't quite remember what was actually part of it. But they're, in general, uh, following a, a Mediterranean diet has been shown to reduce our risks to some degree. So they, they actually talk about the fact that we can probably take care of about 30% of our risk factors for dementia. That's pretty pretty substantial when you think about it, that by by looking after ourselves, sleep is another one, by the way. So having good sleep uh, uh, is can be very uh, important for, because we, a lot of the memory gets consolidated in the night, right? So we want to be able to have regular sleep, um, uh, our sleep pattern to be regular and uh, for our brain to go through the, the sort of the normal um, phases of sleep uh, can be important. So those are some things that, you know, we certainly um, keep an eye on. And the big ones that we can probably address are stress and uh, physical exercise and, um, uh, and our diet. Uh, so those are and and sleep. So those are kind of the four biggies that that we can have some some influence over. So hope that answers that question. Did did anybody have further further discussion around that they they wanted to interject? David, what's a what's a Mediterranean diet? What does it consist of? <laughs> oh darn! <laughs> no, I think it's most well. It's it's it is. Uh, a lot of vegetables and a lot of uh, white meat, like chicken, fish, a lot of fish, um, and less kind of bread and um, and less fat. So it's it's a lot of um, very sort of uh, I don't know how it's pure in the sense that not a lot of added. Um, you know, not a lot of added sauces, not a lot of added um, fats to the, to the, uh, to the cooking process, but, um, but can also be very tasty because there's, you know, a lot of spices involved in the Mediterranean kind of way of cooking, but it's just, it's little keeping your carb, your carbs lower, not, not <laughs> none, like with, um, uh, uh, keto diets and that kind of thing, but, but just, it's a lot of moderation and a lot of white meat versus red and a lot of fish versus uh, versus meat. So if anyone else has is a real expert in the Mediterranean diet, I would be happily invite them to bring that forward. But you can certainly look it up on the on the internet um, for the specifics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Anything else on on preventing dementia? And mm. then we can move on to the next question. The next question, which was a really interesting one, which is um, if you notice that a fan, you know, someone you care about is, uh, thanks, Anne. Um, if you notice, it, so Anne has just put into the chat a link for um, for the Mayo Clinic and their discussion of the Mediterranean diet. So that that will be a good that will be a, a a reliable source of information. So thanks a lot, Anne. Um, so uh, the second question was, if you have a family member or a friend or concerned about somebody's memory, um, what are some of the things you can, and what are some of the things you can do to slow down any memory changes? Shirley, have I got that question right? Oh, you're, you're muted. Can you just unmute yourself, Shirley? There I am. Sorry, sorry about yeah. that. Yes, that's that is that's correct. I um, mean, I think in terms of what I sent you, and I think that question came from Hamid originally. Okay. So, Hamid, if you like to, you know, add or or correct that, you're welcome to do so now. Uh, no, that's all perfect. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, your uh, criteria for the preventing the dementia. That's good enough. Thank you very much. Okay. So the other issue is 
let's say you notice someone in your family having difficulties with memory or with word finding, and you notice that there's something changing. And the question was, you know, what, what, are there things we can actually do to slow the changes down for that person? So the number one thing that's very important is if you notice early changes in somebody's or your own thinking, um, it's really worthwhile going to see uh, your primary care practitioner. So your nurse practitioner, your family doctor, because what looks like a dementia may also be something else that is reversible, right? Mm -hmm. So it, that's why we always say, you know, we don't just sort of say, oh yes, well, she's 85. Of course, she's having memory difficulties because she's 85. That's that, you know, that is certainly not the case. And, and if you go and see your primary health practitioner and they say, well, you're 85, what do you expect? You need to really knock them on the, on the table and say, uh, you know, sorry, that's not, that's not actually correct. Because for instance, let's say you have a vitamin B12 deficiency, or let's say your thyroid is not functioning properly. Those kinds of metabolic changes in the body can actually cause changes in your thinking. Or if your calcium level is very high because you have a little parathyroid tumor, which are remarkably common, these things can really, um, can really cause us to, to, uh, to have confusion or have changes in our, in our cognition. So the most important thing first that can slow things down is to make sure that the person actually does have a dementia and not some reversible illness. The, the probably, and I should say the most common cause of reversible dementias is actually depression. So often, you know, someone with, uh, with depression will present with more um, thinking difficulties than they will, um, uh, you know, than they might express mood changes. So it's why when someone it starts to say, I'm having trouble with my thinking, or you're noticing they're having trouble with their thinking, keep an eye out for other uh, symptoms of depression, like tearfulness, changes in sleep, re you know, uh, fatigue, reduced appetite or weight loss. Um, so keep your eye out for those things. And again, it's a, another reason why you want that person assessed by a primary care practitioner. Um, to make sure that we're not missing something that's imminently uh, treatable and can really Im uh, uh, improve the person's functioning. So that's that's my first piece on that. The second, which is how how can you perhaps influence the slowing of someone's illness if they do have a dementia? And and there are a few things. Uh, some, there are two or three medications that have been on the market now for the last twenty years, which have been shown to slow progression for a year or two, maybe three. It, 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 it's not a, it's not a cure. It is simply um, a way of slowing the progression down. Um, so and 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 yeah. So and that's early on in the in the course of the illness. Um, really, some of the things that we can do as care partners is. We, if we can do our very best to uh, to uh, learn, the, you know, our skills in terms of communication and how we interact with the person, and don't overwhelm them with stress, then sometimes that can also just slow things down and certainly improve the quality of life for you and for them. But uh, but there isn't a lot that we can we actually can do to slow the progression of the illness, except to really provide the love and the care and the stimulation, you know, um, and, and as best we can um, for the person. So any, any questions on that one before we, before we move on? Okay. All right. So I'm going to, is it possible to share screen? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Let me just do one thing first. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now.
Okay. So caring for ourselves as, as dementia caregivers. And just to say, if you don't have a family member who lives with dementia, but you have an older family member who's in care and has a lot of frailty, this is for you as well, right? We're really talking about caring for ourselves as caregivers, uh, you know, generally. Um, and, and can I just ask, like, feel free if you have a question, I can't see everybody at this point, but if you if you just un unmute yourself and just pop in your question, um, that would be great because it's far more interesting when we actually have discussions than when we you know kind of make it um, just a one way discussion. So feel free. So Rosalind Carter had this lovely quote, and she said, "There are only four kinds of people in the world: those who have been caregivers." those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And I think that's really an, a, a very important quote because it really helps us to understand that caregiving is going to touch all of us at some point or other. Um, and usually by the time we need a caregiver, we've probably already done some caregiving uh, as well. But I really appreciate that, um, you know, that quote. Um, so regardless, you know, of which of these four groups you, you find yourself part of, um, life serves us some pretty wild ups and downs, you know, it's part of being human, it's part of being alive. And the question for all of us to explore is, well, what's in my toolbox for dealing with the challenges of life, of which caregiving is, is a really significant, um, stressor, um, so when you're a dementia caregiver, your your toolbox really needs to be quite robust because thing what what's happening when you're caring for somebody with a dementia? Things are evolving. They're constantly changing. Have you had that experience where you you know things are kind of going along? And you go, oh, maybe this is maybe it's going to stay like this for a while, and then things shift. And there's uh there's having to get used to a not only another uh another loss. Uh, of of the person's abilities, but there's the loss as well of of the our ease of access to the person. Like it gets harder to actually connect with the person. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't be done, and 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 it can be done, but it's a it just keeps changing, right? We think we understand, and then it's constantly shifting. Um, so you have to be able to hold on to your connection with your family member as they are now in this moment. And also grieving the changes uh, in the relationship as you knew it, because it's just, it's not the way it was. It keeps, things keep changing. Um, and so, so resilience, which is really what we're aiming for by caring for ourselves, um, it requires us to develop our internal resources and our external resources. And we're going to have a little look at that. So just so you know that um, the sort of research shows that that forty six percent of family caregivers are are spouses, forty four percent are adult children, and forty three percent work full time. Right. So that's a very um, important group to pay attention to, which is the people who are working and also providing care to their to their family members, because it's that's a whole even more complicated um, level of of challenge. The majority are women, the majority, you know, live uh, in the same place, uh, and the majority uh, provide care every day. Um, so you can probably tell me, and I, I actually should probably just stop sharing for a minute, and then we'll come back to this, but what what are some of the, the challenges that you face as, as a caregiver? And especially now, because you're all caring for somebody who is living in care. So what are the challenges that, and, and maybe go back to the challenges that you have faced and then the ones that you're facing now? You just, just popcorn, just whoever um, feels like sharing. What are the, some of the, the challenges you face as a dementia caregiver? Having enough time to be with your loved one. Yes. Thank you, Elaine. So time right and having the time to be with the person that you that you are supporting and that you're caring for yeah what other things 
or challenges. Caring for more than three people at once. Aha, so the number of people and the different needs that they each have uh, are so, so demanding. And yeah, so it could certainly, can certainly be that. Thank you. Susan, are you, have you got some? No, I was just thinking that it's, um, it's a bit of a struggle coming up with different ways to answer the same question for me. Um, why haven't you been in to see me? Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, right. So, so sorry. So that so replying to repetitive questions, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the same one over and over and over, and uh, and what does that? How does that affect you? Um, I get frustrated. Yeah. Yes. I bet if you look around the room, frustration is a big one. Yeah. It's more, I'm looking for ways to answer it that don't frustrate, or I'm trying not to point out to her because she already knows that she's losing her memory right I right antagonize that or make it worse for her ah, beautifully said and and that's that's tiring as well right when we're trying to be very aware and mindful of how we answer a question when really what we'd like to say is oh my gosh I have told you nine times you know yeah. when I was last here or I'm here every day or for goodness sake you know and because it's it's so it's being able to to recognize too when the frustration is there and to maybe um to find ways to to pause long enough that we can then give an answer that probably is going to be more um more supportive to the person so right it's, that's that's a great example thank you so those kinds of repetitive questions what other things do you find challenging um, oh sorry go ahead angela go ahead angela. Uh, it's not for me, but it's other residents that live in my mom's care facility. Yes. I think don't realize that they are losing their memory. Yes. And how do you converse with them when they feel they haven't been included in an activity where they were actually present? Right. And get very agitated that they haven't been told and they're going to go down and talk to the people in charge. And so how do you explain to them that they were there and then they are very agitated saying that they weren't? Right. So you don't want to argue with them, but at the same time, it's yes. how do you learn those skills to, to deal with somebody else that hasn't, doesn't realize that they're losing their memory? Yes. Yes. So, so being, a, so what you're describing is, is, is communication skills, both of you, both Susan and Angela, like, how do you, how do you work with, with people who, who are very upset and, and in their reality, they, they were not part of something, even though, you know, they were, and how do you, how do you support them um, and to, to settle, to, to kind of, to, to make peace with whatever happened. Yeah. It's, um, and 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 that was a tricky one. You know that sometimes it's there isn't anything we can say because you're absolutely right. We don't want to argue with the person because dementia wins every time, right? Every time. So you might some things that I've kind of learned to do are I give the I give the logical answer once. I will offer the logical answer that you know. Oh, George, uh, you know. I'm pretty sure I saw you there, but, but maybe I'm wrong, right? Like you, you, you can, you know, or you can just say, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you were there, George. And then if George, if, if that actually escalates George, George's frustration, then at that point, it's like, let go of the logic. And now we're going to go to what is George needing? George is needing reassurance. What is George needing? He's needing to feel included. Um, you know, so, so it's kind of looking what's beneath his agitation and some of it's going to be his memory impairment, but what is he feeling like right now? He wants to be included. So, uh, so, you know, I might say, I, I, uh, you know, I'm not sure, but I could really use some help over here, you know, I, and, and it's like, I'm going to try and draw, uh, George out into something that he might find interesting or engaging now, rather than deal with, you know, and if he says, I want to go and see those people downstairs, then, you know, you just say, okay, well, you know where to find them. You know, I mean, don't, you don't have to take him, but
but you can just sort of, okay, yeah, you, I hear you're really frustrated. Very frustrating, isn't it? When things aren't, you know, you're pretty clear on what's going on, but, you know, but it, if things are, you know, we're telling you different. Yeah, that's frustrating. It's just basically we have to kind of let go of the logic and try to go where he is, but not tell him you're right. You weren't there because he was, but it's the frustration that he's feeling that I can sometimes address. So yeah, I go for the emotion and go for, can I, can I engage you now in something that not just kind of, you know, go down to the end of the hall and get busy, but well, George, I, I don't know what happened before, but I really could use some help here. Or would you be, you know, would you like to join us for coffee? Because we're having, you know, so that it's, it, it's just shifting the attention to something that's more kind of wholesome, if you like, more, more productive, if you can. And then if it, you can't just be able to sort of know you've done what you can. I don't know. Does that answer the question, Angela? It's really, it's a tricky, tricky, tricky. But you're so right. Yeah, we don't want to get into fights because they win. It, you know, it wins every time. So communication, it like these themes around communication are 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 really big. And maybe that's the next one, Shirley, that we should we should address is communication. If you if you mm -hmm. want, we can actually do a bit more on that. Okay. Okay. So let me just um, go back to my screen here. And these are some of the things that people tell us and and um, um, just trying to, Elaine, thanks, because I, I had to scroll through to find your name, but Elaine sort of identified the exhaustion, right? The yeah. fatigue, especially when you're caring for more than one person, the believing somehow that I should be able to do this, right? I should be able to do it all. You know, I know this person so well, I know, I, I know them, better than anybody does. So therefore I should be able to, to, to do all the care for them. Mm -hmm. um, not asking for help, yeah. right? Just again, sort of feeling like uh, asking for help is, is weak or a sign of weakness, but being able to ask others for help. Dealing with old challenges in relationships. So Susan was describing sometimes, and uh, uh, sometimes what, what, where you've had challenges in your old relationship. I'm not saying this was the example you gave, Susan, but sometimes old challenges re recur because the person uh, isn't really able to track um, what what's going on and, and they start asking you things or they, they start pushing your buttons um, similarly to the way they did, you know, years ago, even though you thought you'd put that all to bed. It's particularly common for, for children of uh, parents is you know when when we're when we when we live in our families they there is often you know complicated relationships and then we go our separate ways and we you know we we work somewhere and we see our parents every so often if you come back into the mix and all of a sudden are looking after them a lot of those old challenges reemerge when you thought wow i haven't felt like this since i was a kid and it's it can be very common people tell us they feel isolated they feel uncertain because the future is uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen with this illness and how it's going to unfold. There's this ongoing grief and loss that really needs to be acknowledged because yes, you're not, you haven't lost the person physically, but it gets, as I said, it gets harder and harder as the, the person's abilities change. We have to acknowledge that those things we have lost, you know, they have lost something. We've lost a part of of our connection with them and then constantly having to compensate for it. So there's a lot of demand emotionally there as well. We've got the financial and the legal concerns that sometimes arise when we're caregivers and then navigating the healthcare system, which, you know, is, is, uh, is not for the faint of heart yeah. because it's, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, less than optimal. So mm -hmm. that I fully acknowledge that and, and that alone can be a really exhausting part of the caregiving experience. So you can see, right? There's That's a lot of challenges. Now you might not have all of them and I hope you don't, but these are things that need to be acknowledged, right? Um, and that we can't do this. We can't do this care thing we call caregiving without experiencing some pain. And it's not a failing when we struggle. It's totally understandable. This is a very 
it's a very complex situation that you find yourselves in. But we can we can do some things to really look after ourselves in the in this uh, dementia caregiving journey. So, and and so, you know, the earlier I ask myself, what is it that I need as a dementia caregiver? How do I look after myself? Um, you know, that really stands us in good stead. And the funny part is, of course, when someone you love gets a diagnosis, where does all the attention go? It goes on the needs of your of your loved one, right? Of your, of your relative, of your friend, or of your, you know, of, of your partner. It's like all of our energy goes towards them. And we as caregivers need some, we need attention for ourselves. We, we really do. And the healthcare system is only just starting to recognize that if we don't look after the person with the illness and their family member, we end up with two patients and not one, right? So it's very important that that we really focus on growing our resilience. And resilience, um, Linda Graham, who, who wrote a lovely book about resilience, she calls it the capacity to bend with the wind and to go with the flow and to bounce back from adversity. So that's, that's, that's what we want to kind of grow in ourselves is our capacity to bend with the wind, which is the illness, go with the flow, like the fellow who insists he wasn't at the, you know, at the group, even though you know he was, how do I go with that flow? And how do I bounce back from adversity when things don't go well, when I have a really difficult interaction with my, my uh, care partner, or when I have a really difficult interaction in the healthcare system, how do I care for myself? Right? How do I look after myself? And that's that's the question we're asking here. Um, yeah, so resilience is kind of how we approach situations that we didn't ask for and how we get up from the ground each time we fall off the horse, which when you're doing dementia caregiving, it can be almost daily. So it's how do I really pad my pad myself so I I can I don't break my bones, but I can get back up when I need to. So here's the key message. This is, if you take nothing else out of this discussion, um, I really need to also get my clock here because I, I could chat up a storm forever. Um, self-care, okay, self-care is not selfish. It's essential. So when I'm caring for, for my dad, uh, both my mom and my dad who lived with dementia, I actually recognized that I needed ways to re, uh, re-energize my battery, to refill my battery. Uh, because if I didn't, then I had less to give him and I was far less patient and, um, and, and things didn't go well. And yet no one talks about this at the very beginning uh, when a diagnosis is made. Time often isn't spent with the family member to say, okay, so we're embarking on a journey. Let's talk about how you care for you in this experience. And I think it's something we need to do much with much more intentionality. But right now, often people say, well, I can't take, you know, five minutes for myself. There's just too much to do. And my, my retort to that is actually if you take five minutes and actually pay attention to your own well-being, you'll actually come back, you know, with more uh, energy to do the things that you're being asked to do. But it requires kind of a switch in our mindset that we're not being selfish. We're actually uh, caring for ourselves. So that's why there's this wonderful analogy between being on a, an airplane and listening to that uh, the safety instructions, which of course we hardly ever do, but what's the instruction around your oxygen mask? Should it fall from that compartment above? Put on your own oxygen mask first before traveling with another dependent. Why did they say that? I'm just going to stop here. Why did they say put on your own oxygen mask first? Because if you don't and the pressure changes, you're probably going to pass out 
And then who's there to look after the person you actually need to, you know, support. So again, it's critical that we learn to put on to put on our own oxygen mask. And what does that, you know, what does that actually look like? And that's what we're going to talk about moving forward. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to just move ahead here. Um, and I'm going to say there's two aspects of caring for ourselves. The first is to tap into external resources. So what are the things that we can actually, um, what are the things that outside of us we can, we need to be able to take care of ourselves? And one of the things that we really need is knowledge. So when we're caring for somebody with a dementia, we really need to understand the illness. We need to understand the trajectory or the path of this illness. Uh, and we need to know kind of where am I, where are we on this, on this journey? So I know what I might expect next. It's not to say that I, I can definitely pre be predicted, but it does give me um, more confidence in dealing with, uh, with, with my with the person I'm looking after. Also, what's available to me in terms of resources in the community? So do am I actually hooked up with the Alzheimer's Society uh, and and first link? And is that helpful to me? What about what do they offer? What can I, you know, where can I actually get my support? And they run excellent support groups in many uh, communities. Um, and if the Alzheimer's Society of British Columbia is not for you, then I don't know how many of you have checked out Family Caregivers of BC, but they have they have a wonderful website and they run uh, they have a, um, a support line that you can call and they do one to one coaching um, and and it's not specifically around dementia but it's for all caregivers and I think it's again we want to connect in with um, with people who can support us to develop our knowledge and and what we need personally. So then uh, the second thing externally is it takes a village. And that's what I'm talking about is reaching out, reaching out and, and reaching out to family, uh, reaching out to uh, friends, um, and then reaching out to these organizations that are there to support us. And then also reaching out to the healthcare system. Um, and, and sometimes it takes a, uh, it takes support to to know how to connect with the healthcare system and how to advocate for your family member effectively. Um, and and so, one of the things that can really support us. And again, we don't learn about it at the very beginning, but we need to develop a support network around the person we're supporting and around ourselves. Um, but. So sometimes uh, the things I'm saying, you, you could say, well, I wish I'd known that at the beginning. And this is something that we're really, uh, you know, kind of working on getting the message out there. But it takes a village to care for somebody with a dementia. You cannot do it alone. So the second part of caring for ourselves is building our internal resources. Um, and, and so this is we can't actually ch necessarily change the course of the illness. So what we need to do is work on how we relate to the bumps and the and the the bruises that arise because we're caring for somebody with an illness. And the only person I even have a chance of influencing in this world is me, um, because I I'm the, the one I probably control most and have the best chance of of um, of shifting. So I need to often do a fair amount of work about not only understanding, for instance, communication, but understanding my own emotional reaction to things. So we talked a bit about this at the very beginning, and so I won't spend a ton of time on this, but we said, what are the things you need for a healthy mind? So we need sleep, we need physical exercise, this focus time, so really using our our mind and training our our, our attention, um, because I don't know about you, but our attention can go all over the the map, and a lot of it gets in the way of our being uh, focused and helpful at when we want to be. We need to have downtime. We need to have playtime. 
how many, you know, how many you've playtime? Wow, I don't remember having a playtime for so long. But play, it might be dance, it might be singing, it might be music. It doesn't have to be something big. It could be while you're washing the dishes, you put on your favorite music and you really allow the body to move to it. It could be, you know, playing a game of crib with some friends, but inter introducing these, these sort of um, tiny elements, you might think they're kind of useless, but actually they're what rejuvenate and help help us to stay healthy. And so as is that connecting time. So connecting with friends, um, especially and, and family in ways that are meaningful. So that's, that's, that's kind of the building the body and the brain. And we talked very briefly, it's not on here, but you know, eating well as well. So for me, there are two key attitudes that really help us to care for ourselves when we're in the when we're in a caregiving role and one of them is growing our curiosity so as susan described you know she often sort of wonders how can i answer this question that i've heard for the 900th time in a way that isn't going to upset you know my partner um and 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 at the same time how do I work with the frustration that I'm feeling? So I need to grow my curiosity about, so what, what is going on here? Or what's going on for me? Or what am I feeling in this moment? Because sometimes when, when we can get curious about what we're, what's happening for us, then in fact, we can make a conscious decision about how we want to proceed rather than just move into reaction. You know, like, oh my gosh, I said that, you know, 50 times, um, you know, or, or oh, I wish, you could, why do you ask these questions over and over again? Th these are the frustrating, these are the sort of reactions to frustration. So one of the practices that really helps us to uh, learn how to, to, to kind of get curious about what I'm feeling in the moment, and because it gives us a lot of information, is a, pro is a practice called stop. So I just want to run us through that it takes literally it just takes a couple of minutes but stop each letter stands for a step in the process so the first one is to stop uh, so i'm just running through them stop stop what you're doing put you know put your as best you can you know put everything down and just focus take three slow deep breaths preferably not pushing it not really but just slow gentle deep breaths with a little bit of e emphasis on the exhale compared to the inhale. And then observe and ask yourself, ooh, what's going on in the body, in the body, in my body right now? Where am I, you know, what am I, no what sensations are kind of making themselves known in this moment? Because the body is the first place emotion shows up. So it's very helpful to check in. Oh, look, my shoulders are up around my ears or, oh my gosh, I've got my hands in fists. I didn't even realize that, right? So checking in with the body, then uh, checking in with what are the thoughts I'm having right now? So I can actually name them it, because one of the things that, that really helps us when we, when we feel overwhelmed by a situation or feel frustrated in a situation is to name what, what is going on in the mind. So I, I notice, oh, um, I'm noticing the thought that this is the most frustrating event of my day. I'm noticing the thought that I would really like to tell them to pull up their socks and do better. I'm noticing the thought that, right? So, because when we can notice what we're thinking, then, then it doesn't, it's not running the show, actually. Then we can say, oh, okay, so how do I want to respond to that, which is the P. But, the, so we look at what's going on in the body, what's going on in my thoughts, and what's going on in my emotions. And then once we've observed that, we are going to the P. So how, if I feel all these things, how do I actually want to proceed? How do I want to move forward in the next moment so that I do it wisely? What needs my attention so that I move forward as wisely as I can, the best I can, you know, again, it's not, per we're not looking for perfection, but how do, and I can guarantee if you're feeling frustrated by the situation and you do this short practice, then, then you will have also slowed down enough to actually decide what it is you want to do next. 
So let would you would you be willing to do a stop practice with me? Uh, just just like connect in and just see what's there. And you can either you don't have to close your eyes. You can just it's probably best to look down towards the floor if you're not going to close your eyes. But I'm going to invite you to actually stop. So stop as best you can. You're going to just pause. You're going to say, I'm not, I'm going to let go of all the thoughts I just had as best I can. And just, I'm going to come into this moment right here. And now I'm going to ask you to take three slow breaths. You might want to count about four or five on the in-breath. And maybe if you can, six or seven on the out-breath through your nose, through the mouth, whatever is more comfortable, but just in a relaxed way. Breathing in and breathing out. And breathing in and breathing out and breathing in and breathing out and then moving to the o of stop so observing right so what am i noticing right now in this moment what's here in my body and maybe you don't notice anything and that's fine but what are you noticing? What sensations are present for you right now? So you might feel one hand touching the other or your feet against the floor. But what's there that's that's kind of drawing your attention to it? And then what thoughts are here right now? Can you just sort of name the thoughts that are sitting uh, almost on the movie screen of the mind. What's here? What are you thinking? Maybe what an inter what a weirdo thing I'm asked to do. Or, you know, I wonder how this is going to work. Or I wonder if I'm doing this right. I don't know what thoughts are there for you. And what emotions might be here? And there may be nothing. I'm just checking in with curiosity, right? We're curious. What am I noticing? And then moving into the P, if I'm noticing this in the body and this in the mind and these emotions, what might I be needing to do as I move into the next moment of my day, right? And the next moment of this experience or this, this time we have together. And you might also want to praise yourself or give yourself some gratitude for having paused, for having stopped for having checked in with yourself. And then you can open the eyes or raise the gaze back to the, to the group. And I'm just curious, what, what did you notice? Anything, what did you notice when you stopped? I felt calmer. So you, you noticed a, a, a bit of uh, calming and you know what that is, that calming really, interesting anybody what 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 allows calming to happen it's when we activate the parasympathetic nervous system so the sympathetic nervous system is the one that makes us tense and you know ready to fight or fly you know flee if something is you know really scaring us we move into a sympathetic tone right and the whole body gets tense when we move that three slow deep breaths they're the magic that turns on the opposite side of the autonomic nervous system, which is rest and digest or the parasympathetic nervous system. And that allows a little bit of slowing, slows your heartbeat, slows your breathing. And it just allows for a little bit of calm that Elaine described for some, and it doesn't mean everybody would experience it, but yeah, so that's, that's interesting that you noticed that. What else did you notice? Anything surprise you like sensations that you experienced or Thoughts that you were having that you didn't realize you were having? I was surprised to, <laughs> to find some residual stress and tension in my body when we stopped and were paying attention. And I realized that I was, as I often do just before family council, I get all worked up and worried about how things are going to go, who's going to show up, who's not. And, and I thought by the time we get underway and Dr. D's taken it, <laughs> <laughs> on the road and I don't need to worry that I would be relaxed but when you we went through that step of observing I I really noticed 
the areas where I was still tense and and stiff and thinking, whoa, where was that from? And I think I realized that was just a residual from. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so it gives, it gives us information, honestly, that we, we didn't necessarily have because when we're moving as quickly as Elaine was describing, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not surprising, you know, that we don't, we're, we're on autopilot, just going from thing to thing, to thing, to thing, to thing. So this is the stop practice helps us check in and say, what's going on. And that gives us useful information to know, okay, so here's how I want to proceed moving forward. Any other thoughts before I move on? Okay. All right. So let's share my screen again. So learning to stop and care caregivers who we work with um, in the Dementia Caregiver Resilience uh, Clinic, uh, they tell us, you know, dollars to donuts that the stop practice, because it's quick, it's focused, and it's and you can get really good at it is bar none one of the most helpful things for interrupting uh challenging conversations when when we find ourselves in the middle <laughs> of a feeling you know it's just it's allowing us to pause so yeah so play around with that and i'll send uh the steps of the stop practice to shirley and she can send it out to you so i said that uh, curiosity is probably one of the key attitudes that really helps us in dementia caregiving. When we can get curious about what's going on for ourselves and for our partner, it makes a big difference. And the other one that the other attitude that's essential to caregiving is self compassion. What's well, actually compassion? And compassion is often far easier to give to someone else than it is to give to ourselves. But the, uh, the, the science around self-compassion is that it can really, um, it can really support us to, to care for ourselves. So when things are not going well, when I have just, uh, you know, had a difficult conversation with my care partner or with, you know, or with a staff member, whatever it happens to be, what I can do for myself is I can offer myself the same kindness the same care that I would offer a good friend who told me what had just happened. So sometimes it's hard for me to offer it to myself, but I certainly would always be kind to a friend who was saying, and then this happened. And of course, it's like, oh my goodness, I'm sure that was very difficult for you. Where sometimes when it's me who's going through a difficult situation, my inner critic can get going and sort of say, oh, come on, it's not that bad. What are you whining about now? you know, things like that, that aren't helpful for me at all. So there is a, a there is a, a very simple practice that we call the self-compassion break. And it allows us to, um, to, to really begin to explore what does it look like for us to be kind to ourselves when things are difficult. So it's a way that I can always not only be compassionate to the person that I'm caring for, I've done that in spades, but how much have I actually cared for myself when I've been distressed? And self-compassion can allow us to do that. So um, when we, I'm, I'm gonna offer you one phrase that I would <clears throat> encourage you to write down and actually use when you're feeling, um, when when things are really difficult and that's, this is the phrase, may I be kind to myself? So it's may I be kind to myself just as I am in this moment. So let's say I'm feeling angry, right? May I be kind to myself just as I am in this moment. So with the anger that I have, can I be kind to myself? Um, if I'm feeling sad, in the sadness, can I be kind to myself? In the uh, irritation or frustration, you know, can, I, can I be kind to myself just as I am in this moment? So it's a, offering ourselves kindness and care when things are difficult. Even the things about me that I maybe wish I didn't have, that's exactly the moment I need kindness right? So, so self-compassion is about offering yourself kindness and <clears throat> noticing 
that you need some kindness, right? Noticing that you're struggling, noticing that the moment is difficult, and then offering yourself some phrases like, may I be kind to myself in just as I am in this moment? Or may I, may I be in my own corner? Uh, may I um, may I hold myself with compassion? We each find the phrases that actually uh, resonate for us. But when things are difficult, we need to be there supporting ourselves. Uh, and, and oftentimes our partners can't be there to support us the way they used to do. So I really need to up my own care for myself. So developing self-compassion can be really helpful. Okay. Just seeing what I wanted to talk about next. Okay. I think I think we could probably pause there and just ask what questions do you have around self-care? And have I made I may not have made quite a compelling enough case for why it's absolutely critical, why it's essential and not selfish. But I'll add to that, when we care for ourselves with, and sometimes people get self-care confused with, you know, going to a spa or, you know, having to go on a trip or no, uh, caring for ourselves can happen in just moments, right? Can happen in moments we think are throwaway moments, but if we really focus our attention, it's incredibly helpful and valuable. If we don't, we are also more likely to become either physically or emotionally ill. So if you have, for instance, um, inflammatory diseases, arthritis, ar like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or, um, or uh, any autoimmune diseases, uh, add on the stress <coughs> of caregiving, they can often get worse. Or if you have high blood pressure or you're borderline high blood pressure and you're dealing with this chronic stress without incorporating these, these uh, self-care strategies, your physical health can suffer. And of course, if you are um, under a lot of stress, sometimes you feel more anxious. So you can feel anxiety or actually you can develop depression. And it, we're this recognizing early and taking the preventative steps as best we can, can really support either our preventing getting ill, or if we are already ill, they'll help us uh, kind of move forward. So yeah, so questions, thoughts, throw them out. Love to hear what you're thinking. Angela, well, were you going to say something? Yes, I just want to step out of my mom's room because she's watching Chinese opera. So oh, yes, please. Um, I totally understand, like, you know, that self-care is essential, but sometimes when I take time, I still feel guilty. Yes. And that's yes. hard to, like, you know, even though you go, I need to do this, but at times it's like, you still, how do you deal with the guilt? The guilt, yeah, thank you. Thank you for naming that. Um, well, I think the question is, what is the guilt what do, what is what does the guilt say like what what are you feeling guilty about what is it because everybody has a slightly different I story just just taking that time okay okay i mean i i live on the island so i come over for a week and i go back for a week so if i go back i feel sometimes if i'm enjoying myself i could, I could be there spending time with her right right so if you're I, there and you're limited right yeah yes Yes. And for you to be able to show up when you come for the week with some energy and some um, ability to really be present with your mom, it, it's you're doing her a favor by actually nourishing your own well-being. I know it's it's counterintuitive a little bit, but it's it's kind of like you need to put a little, you know, saying on your on your uh mirror at where you know when you go back to the island that says self-care is not selfish it's essential right because these are old beliefs these are old stories these are old um you know parts of us that that whisper these things in our ear but they're actually not 
true. They're they're actually, you know, they're they're kind of they're they're old things that tried to keep us in line. But really what we need to do is recognize that to actually do my to be the kind of caregiver I want to be with my mom, I need to nourish my own well-being. Because again, if if you the guilt um you know guilt is useful if we have done something that's problematic but you're not doing anything problematic so that guilt would be lovely if you could gradually learn to to let that go and part of it is practicing part of it is actually um you know really Im immersing yourself in understanding you know why this is so important that you do step out and look after yourself if you have that opportunity so if you were there all the time, yes, you'd be there all the time, but you also wouldn't be bringing your best self to the game. So you're really doing your mom a favor as well by coming in a in a state of, of you know, hopefully greater relaxation as you just allow the guilt to be present for a moment or two and then remind yourself, yeah, but if I don't care for myself, I won't be a good caregiver to my mom. Oh, I mean, I understand that logically. But you know, it's, it's the the other emotional part where you're trying to kind of fight those two saying, but you need this for you. you yeah. But yep. part of it's like you know, because sometimes I, I you know I hear staff say to me, you should just move over here. Right. You know. Right. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so fair. You know, these are the th the kinds of things that we actually we need to work with, and we need to recognize that yeah, there's lots of the, the mind plays lots of tricks with us. And, and uh, we have to be, you know, is that really true? You know, is that really true that I should, you know, move over there? Is that really necessary? Is that really going to improve things? What is actually, what is the reality? And, and part of doing the stop practice is actually, you know, getting yourself out of your thinking mind, you know, which, which comes up with all kinds of reasons why you should be doing something different and just coming back into like just this present moment, what is true right here and right now? So yeah, it's a it's a it's a project because you're mm -hmm. needing to deprogram some of these ideas that you've held for a long time. So yeah, I don't have the easy answer, but but no. bless your heart. Keep 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 at listen to my voice, Angela. <laughs> self care, <laughs> not selfish. It's essential. Yeah. yeah, and I just I'm gonna throw in Angela. Don't feel guilty, <laughs> please. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> I did that for. A five years drove back and forth from five hours 100 miles to, to here back wow. every week so I did what you're doing and it's hard it is hard it is hard it is hard and we want to fully acknowledge that yes and yeah. just really let yourself off the hook because you're doing a marvelous job just keep saying it over and over and over again until you start to internalize it I think there you okay, go well, when you see me you can remind me too Susan <laughs> yeah, I will. great yeah, yeah. excellent Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I think, Angela, that was so beautifully said because I think that's the challenge for all of us, right? When we have, when we have been doing things a certain way, and we ha we hear old messages from family, or you know, it and it requires great courage, right, to actually step away from the old way of doing things. And into a place of of real of self respect and and care for oneself. Yeah, you matter just as much as your mom, my dear one. Yeah, I have a question, but it goes back to a previous. Um, yeah, you were talking about communicating. A stumbling block that we always seem to have trouble with is when we go to the hospital with with mom. Yep. <gasps> It's that hurdle of getting through to the medical staff there because I realize that they don't know me and that they want to talk to her and they want to find out what's wrong with her. Right. But she automatically deflects and will stare at me. And, and if, if I jump in too quickly, then they'll cut me off and say, I want to hear from her, which I understand that, but right. we can say it over and over again. She's a dementia patient, but it's totally ignored. Yeah. That's, it's frustrating. It is very frustrating. Yeah. And, and part of, so 
on the <clears throat> on the upside the the intention as i would understand it honestly is wanting to respect that your mom is her like is a person and yeah. that so cuz the opposite is often something you'll see where the, per, the 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 nurse or physician or professional will come in and pay no heed to your mom at all and just talk to you about her yeah. right and so so i would just personally i would just try and reframe it as okay they want to hear from her so she will look at me and i i will say something to the physician like let me know when you'd like when you would like to hear from me because because yeah. i think i think this might overwhelm my mom so if you put it in the context of why you know why this might be harmful to her and and not you know not they they might you know they're trying to honor her as a person but it's it's probably un well it's okay for the first question or two yeah but then when they see that she just looks to you then she's saying i'm overwhelmed i i can't do this yeah so okay. yeah it is very frustrating but but you know i i kind of appeal to the um you know let me know when I when I can be helpful to you because I think I think it will be a bit much for mom if if we keep asking her a ton of questions. That's a good point. But you know, I'm I'm ever hopeful. But it, it's yeah, it is very frustrating. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, it's more totally true about the healthcare system. Yeah, the emergency too. Yeah, but people yeah. with dementia will tell you how difficult <laughs> it is for them. <laughs> when no one asks me any questions and they just look to my daughter and ask the questions. Yeah. Cause so I, I, I would, I'm glad they're erring on that side, but if they could know when to call it, right. When to cut it. Yeah. Cut it. Yep. Yep. Dr. D I have, I, I had a situation with my mom last week um, where she suddenly, and this hasn't happened before, but I know it's fairly common with people who have dementia, but she suddenly looked around her room and she kept looking around her room and she said, um, where, where are we? This is, this is not my room. She said, you know, she said, can, and she had this look of anxiety and panic on her face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She said, I need to, why, let's go, let's go home. You need to take me home. Right. And right. for me, it was, it hit me out of the blue and I'm just wondering like the grief and the sadness I felt in the moment was hard for me to hide from her. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do we balance that? Like, I don't want to, I try to reassure her. And I said, you know, she's been living in the same room for four years. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, I guess I, my question is, is, is it, do we, I guess we, it's, we need to hide our emotions from her, first of all. And second of all, what, like, how do I, how do I respond in that situation? Yeah. Emotionally. Well, you know, it certainly does happen that quite commonly for people, all of a sudden, what was familiar is unfamiliar and mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily last very long, but it, but it, it will come, come and go. Okay. Um, and so it's kind of the same thing that when we were talking about relying on logic or or letting go of the logic um you know it it, it can be helpful at, at those times depending if, she, if she's in bed or she's not in bed or you know she's she's in her wheel excuse me wheelchair you could just say uh well you know let's let's go let's go for you know let's go for a walk mm -hmm. right let's head out of here right and with a little toodle around the whole perimeter of Fairhaven and then head back into her room Oftentimes what happens is it it's a reset and the person all of a sudden feels quite comfortable in that space again. So it's it's sort of again break you want to break the actually it's it's you're you're actually getting her out of her limbic, you know, her fear center. And mm -hmm. by resetting, by going, you know, elsewhere and then returning, oftentimes that will just have allowed her to to settle again. So, I mean, in, and in terms of showing the grief, um, you know, I I don't know how that showed up for you. Did, was it with tears or what did I, you? Yeah, I felt close to that. I didn't. I mean, I didn't. Yeah. 
you know, I kept control of myself, but I yeah. just, I just felt in my heart that, you know, that, that thing. And, but I did try to, um, I didn't argue. I said, you know, well, uh, this is your home. I mean, this is your room. Yeah. And, yeah. and then I, I redirected, I just, um, yeah. you know, focus on something else in that moment but lately she it has been a bit of a recurring theme for her she somehow has gotten into her head that she's lost her home and yes. her and her house so yeah so she's experiencing grief right yeah. It, yeah you know and this is the thing that that you know that's that's important for her actually you know if, although she might mm -hmm. not be able to say it in or, an organized way it's so you know you can you have a choice you could also try something like so you're you're missing your home, Mom. We're at Fairhaven, but you're missing your your old home. It's been a long time since we lived together in that house, right? Mm -hmm. or, or you know, so that so so it's offering her a little space, emotional space, to be sad and for mm -hmm. you to be sad. I feel sad too, Mom. Right? Mm -hmm. So then there's space for both of you to have some emotions, and then let's redirect, right? Because we don't mm -hmm. want to stay there, you know, too long. Because for her, it might be harder to get out. Mm -hmm. If that okay. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, unless there's any other, any questions, comments, thank yous. <laughs> we have two minutes left with Dr. Trance and uh, I'm totally uh, grateful for your availability and willingness to come again, Dr. Trance. So it's been, it's been super helpful and for me personally and um so well, thank you for having me and just keep uh keep reminding yourself self-care is not selfish it's absolutely essential mm -hmm. and it really you know no matter what the old messages are you know they, this is this is actually one that has evidence behind it right it really it really does so so thank you for <laughs> hanging in and yes. and and coming tonight and spending that this time with me thank you